You guys are very comfortable with this sort of metaphorical gap between the speaker and, and the audience. Yeah. Um, I would normally say what we say in the army, which is, I don't bite, we kill people other ways. Um, but, uh, you know, this is fine, I can deal. Uh, the uh, room seems to have decent acoustics. Uh, but it'll be an interesting uh, talk using command voice the whole bloody time. Come on forward. So, you say, say come forward. Well, I'll leave it to there. He knows how to kill, but he doesn't do it regularly. Only occasionally. Yeah, not human. Their microphone are on. Well, yeah, that's, but, that's but, fine. But, come no, on, a bit of user, okay. the audience in participation engagement. Yeah, you have to look, look like you know. the lights off. That's your point. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 the screen's up there. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. He's the leader. He's used to control his crowds. So, there we go. So, uh... Oh, I got it. Alright, well, I'm just introducing him. I wrote the rough guide. <laughs> it's all my fault you're here. I'm glad you've turned up. And now I'll, leave, I'll pass on to you. There we go. And I'll film it. It'll all be on the, on, on the internet by this evening. So, I want to uh, thank Professor Pound for inviting me. Uh, I'm here for a variety of reasons, but today I'm here to talk to uh, more of the general audience, and the talk the title that I was given is uh, Game Theory and Evolution, uh, which is interesting. It's sort of um, experimental theater to be given a talk title and then have fun writing a talk around it. Uh, so, you have got a nature paper. On I'm uh, Captain Kirkup, and I'm for, from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and part of my, uh, my job requirements. Uh, include putting a disclaimer on everything, and uh, it says that basically this is not the doctrine of the Department of Defense, and it is my personal opinions. I think if uh, the doc Department of Defense wants to have the right opinions, they will also share my opinions, uh, but uh, I can't say uh, definitively that they would agree. So, let me introduce sort of a problem and frame this out for you. Uh, I deal with bacteria, and in the bacterial world, you could have this population of presumably clonal organisms. And uh, by the principles of Hamilton, uh, which maybe the freshmen are less familiar with, uh, these organisms are very interested in the welfare of their kin, right? Because they carry the same genes, and there's this concept of inclusive selection, inclusive fitness. So you really don't want to go around killing people who share your genes in particular, or else pretty soon your genes aren't around to be shared for very long. And so the mere existence of you suggests that you haven't been killing people with your genes that much. Well, in this case, we have these suicidal bacteria that exhibit every hallmark of viciousness and spite, and they go around killing their close kin. They go around killing organisms of the same species, they produce these molecules of such potency that a single molecule is sufficient to kill. Now, these are, in fact, the most effective antibiotics known to man. And there are dozens, hundreds, even thousands of these bacteriocins that are known in the literature. They occur in every species of bacteria. And so there's even evidence of molecular evolution driving the, the continual divergence of these killer molecules. And so, of course, we have people who are trying to, um, to produce antibiotics. And what they have found over the span of 80 years is that whenever they go into an animal model, whenever they go into nature, to do a natural experiment to introduce organisms that produce these killing molecules, they cannot find any evidence of positive selection for the organisms that are killing their kin. Now this is a very strange fact. These organisms are apparently doing all sorts of effort. They're even committing suicide. We don't see them invading populations. We don't see them persisting longer than sensitive organisms. 
there's really no evidence that there's any advantage to these molecules at all. Well, there are, of course, scientists willing to tell all sorts of just-so stories about what these molecules are up to or why they don't see any evidence of the selection in their experiments. And disappointed though they are that they cannot produce effective antibiotics by studying these molecules, they are willing to write long papers discussing how these bactericins are useful in another setting or they are addictive molecules, toxin antitoxin pairs or they are getting digested in the intestines and so they'll never be effective. And they must be doing something else entirely. And so we have all these hypotheses generated about why these bactericins are present in the environment in such diversity and such numbers and such ubiquity. And yet they're not doing what everybody sees them do in the lab. So, The down button. Yeah, uh, space no, not, not at the moment. So, scientists have this great capacity to generate just so stories. And it leads, hopefully, to hypotheses and hopefully to testing and then to more just so stories. And in this case, mathematics is a tool that actually inhibits your ability to write just so stories because it forces you to write them with some precision. And if you can write your just so story with mathematics, you're going to have an easier time testing it. And so it makes it more difficult to phrase the hypothesis. And it doesn't entirely um, uh, eliminate ambiguity, but it helps along that process. And the mathematics here that was brought to bear was ordinary differential equations. And what we see is we see that the general principles of population genetics apply. And the idea that's brought in is fitness. Now, fitness is this magical property that we have that's expressed in this one simple equation that says that it's basically the number of individuals before and the number of individuals after, in the next generation. And that difference gives you your fitness. But what we actually care about most of the time is something called relative fitness. So you take two organisms and you compete them. And one of them produces more progeny than the other. And it gives you a ratio, and that's going to give you your relative fitness. So what happens with bacteria cells? Well, you put a killer organism in with a sensitive organism. And you've got an interesting problem, because the killer organism is committing suicide every time it produces this molecule. So if you have one killer organism, well, it's got a very low fitness. Uh, it commits suicide, it's dead. But if you have a handful, they produce a whole lot of toxin, and they kill the sensitive organism. And then it's dead. This presents us with another problem. We see both of these kinds, the sensitive organisms and the killer organisms, in the same natural populations of bacteria. But these equations, these ordinary differential equations, give us no stable solution. There's no robust equilibrium point there. One population dies, or the other population dies. So what are we going to do about that? Well. Our problem turns out to be, actually, that we have something a little bit fancier than what I was describing to you. What do you want to do? Yeah, I'll figure it. There we go. OK. So we've got a special problem here. And I sort of highlighted it for you right there. If you have one organism and it commits suicide, its frequency is 0. But if you have a few more of them, its frequency goes way up. Well, this is something called frequency-dependent selection. And uh, actually, frequency-independent selection is really the special case. Uh, it just happens to be the one that population geneticists like. 
because it's more tractable. Frequency dependent selection is the general case. And Hartle and Clark say, because the fitnesses can be any function of, of any functions of allele or genotype frequency, nearly anything can happen. Well, this is bad news. Because we've spent some time framing out our problem in terms of mathematics. And the mathematicians come back and tell you anything can happen. That's a sort of a disturbing place if you're trying to formulate hypotheses. Now, what we've got is a relatively simple case of frequency dependent selection. And your frequency goes up for the killer as your, your fitness goes up as your frequency goes up to a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find a way to improve my modeling. And how am I going to improve my modeling? I'm going to constrain my model. And this is where the game theory comes in. So I'm giving you this narrative arc in which there's the scientist, there's the complexity of the system, and there's this goal. And the helper here is game theory. And the reason that the helper here is game theory is because games provide us with an ability to look at processes where different individuals compete over time for rewards. And if they keep playing the game over and over and over, if one of them keeps losing, they pretty soon figure out and stop using that strategy. In fact, with the bacteria, if one of them keeps losing, they keep dying. And then they really stop using that strategy. And so the only strategies that will persist in a population are strategies that fulfill the general Nash equilibrium, it would be called, which says that if you're a player and you want to adopt a strategy, you don't adopt a strategy that you're sure your enemy can defeat every single time. So we have our conundrum. On the small scale, the killers eliminate sensitive strains at almost every frequency. On a larger scale, they coexist, and we know that in nature. And though resistance to the killing is easily attained through mutations that take out receptors on the cell surface, resistance is not found universally. So what's going on here? Well, we can formulate this as a game. For the purposes of that abstraction, we're going to treat each host that the bacteria are living in as a single habitat. And we're going to look for a well-characterized dynamic system in mathematics that involves several players playing a repeated game. And we're going to look for a model in which any two players, you can tell what's going to happen. Well, OK, we've got the killer, we've got the sensitive. We know what's going to happen there. We've got the killer and the resistant. We can pretty much figure out what's going to happen there. The killer is going to keep committing suicide. The resistant is going to ignore it and keep growing. What happens when we put the sensitive and the resistant together? <laughs> well, the resistant has lost a receptor on its cell surface. So it's going to have a fitness defect. The sensitive has this, and it's going to do just fine. So slowly but surely, you'd expect the sensitive to take over the population. What we've got is we've got this new model. I'm not really understanding this. Use the down arrow or yeah, right arrow. Yeah, I'm using those. Yeah. We've got this potential for a dynamic equilibrium. So what I'm showing you there is I'm showing you a plane in space. And each axis is going to be the frequency of one of these players. And if the organisms are all feeding at the same trough in terms of space or nutrients or whatever limiting factor, then the population will continually exist on that plane. At any of the three vertices where it hits an axis, you're going to have one of the organisms taking over completely. And in the middle, you're going to have all of them coexisting more or less. Now, here's a projection in terms of a triangle. So it's just that plane brought out into space. And if you had a relatively few number of organisms, you could imagine 
that all three are any of the one, or there's some mixture, or let's say there's a total of three organisms, in the very middle there would be one, one, one. Now, in this case, I went and I set up this experiment with three mice in a little cage. And I started us in the middle of the triangle with one mouse colonized each by an organism. And then I let the mice run around and each one of them in their guts had this bacteria. One of them had the killer bacteria, one of them had the resistant bacteria, one of them had the sensitive bacteria. So far it's a pretty simple experiment. I did 12 of those. And except for a couple of glitches where the mice were fighting, I just sort of let the experiments run and I watched which organisms stayed in which guts. And these are the sort of results that I got out. So this is one of the experiments. You can see there's three mice per cage, 12 cages. Red is where the killers are, uh, blue is where the sensitive organisms are, and green is where the resistant organisms are. And what we see is that there tend to be runs with transitions. And I did this experiment again, and I did this experiment with no killers, just with sensitive and resistance. Now here's where the game theory was helpful, because I knew what I was looking for. If I was looking in frequency-dependent selection space, I could fit any model in the world to this data. But because I knew what I was looking for, I was looking for transitions such that S would be replacing R as opposed to R replacing S. I would be looking for the killer replacing the sensitive instead of the sensitive replacing the killer. And so I could do statistical tests. And this essentially follows the process of a Markov chain. So, what I'm doing is I'm sort of filling out what's called the payoff matrix in the game theory. And, fortunately, I suppose, what I found was that for two separate bacteria sins, I was able to demonstrate that this game indeed formed the structure of the interactions of the organism. Now what does this do for me? Well this brings me back into game theory. In the game, these three strategies coexist and we all know this. Nobody walks into a game of rock, paper, scissors and says, I'm never going to play rock because I know it always loses. You keep playing it because you know that it has the same probability of winning as the other two. Now you may lose every time you hit paper but you don't know that you're going to keep hitting paper. And so there's this Nash equilibrium, there's this equilibrium space in a game of this structure. And so now when we go out into a population and we see that there are sensitive and resistant and collison producing organisms there, we know that they're coexisting because they're essentially replacing each other periodically in a dynamic way. It's a dynamic equilibrium, it's not a static equilibrium. Any one of those populations is invadable all the time. But because migration rates are such, they're able to stay in a balance. This is essentially the gift of game theory to us, and it is also the gift of mathematics to us. When we hit a situation in which we don't have a clearly defined set of hypotheses, we scientists have a tendency to go spin tails. And we can spin enormous numbers of tails. What mathematics helps us do is it helps us constrain the space of the models that we're willing to accept and find models with good implications, testable hypotheses, formulate tests and run statistical analyses so that we're forced to leave our intuition at the door and accept some of the hard, real facts of what we observe. Game theory is not the only kind of theory that'll do this. Um, queuing theory, operations research, they all provide us with models 
that are testable. They all provide us with optimization strategies and things that we can expect that organisms will abide by even if they don't know they're following them. But this is really the role of game theory in the mind of the evolutionary biologist, I'd say, is to help formulate well-developed, well-explored models that you can apply to things. And this is why I would highly recommend that students of biology should also be students of mathematics, at least for a while. Um, because if you don't have those models in mind, then when you stumble upon the phenomena, you're sort of lost. <coughs> now, I wanted to bring up one more application of game theory uh, in my life. And this is sort of a, um, a question of how to pursue a scientific career. And so we just asked the question of the bacteria since do they kill, do they not kill? And yes, they kill. So the question is, how does an evolutionary biologist end up in the military? <laughs> and since it's a question I hear at least several times a day whenever I'm outside of my own workplace, I figured I'd address it from the stance of game theory. The question is really a question of trust. So someone comes to you and they say, you have a problem. I can solve your problem. Please, hand me your money and I will solve your problem. I'm not sure what your natural response is, but my natural response is not one of easy, welcoming, open arms, and an open wallet. And frankly, neither is that the stance of the Department of Defense. So what happens? A researcher comes to the Department of Sense and they say, you have a problem. Maybe you need unmanned aerial vehicles, or you need quieter subs. And they say, me, here, you know, in the realm of comparative literature, can provide you with answers to your problems if you just hand me your money. And of course, the Department of Defense says, what does comparative literature have to do with it? And no, we're not going to hand you money. Well, maybe somebody with a slightly more logical background comes and says, you know, I do aerospace, or I do naval engineering. Hand me your money, and I'll solve your problems. Well, the Department of Defense has seen this before. What happens is they hand the money, and then the person goes and writes a lot of papers, and nothing happens about subs or planes or anything the Department of Defense cares about. So they have a strategy to deal with that. It's a very easy strategy. They make you write a lot of reports, and they make you pay a high cost in writing very long grant applications before they're willing to hand you any money. And they watch you very closely. And all of this is very annoying for the scientist. There is another way. It's called costly signaling. Signaling games are a very well known kind of game in which there's imperfect information on each side of the equation. One famous signaling game is Will You Marry Me? Well, the signal there could be just words. On the other hand, if it comes with some expensive hardware, it's more likely to be taken seriously. Similarly, birds, their plumage, elk, the big antlers, there's a lot of cases in which we presume that sexual selection is driven by signaling games. And there are a lot of other kinds of signaling games. Signaling games like, I'm angry, I'm really angry, I'm brandishing a weapon. I'm really, really angry. That is a signal. It's a more important signal if you know that people could be watching and that this will not be taken lightly. It's a costly signal. And in my case, putting on a uniform. It says, I'm going to submit to authority. I'm going to go to training. 
if I'm not doing my job right, well, I've got problems. I'm committed to the cause of the research that I'm proposing, and I'm committed to solving your problems. Now please, give me the money. And what happens? They do. And so, research funding, research facilities, the opportunity to do the job that I want to do. This is a bit of career advice. Costly signaling. Decide what cost you're willing to pay. Make sure the signals count. Otherwise, people are going to keep scrutinizing you and making you write annoying reports. So finally, I would suggest, particularly for the younger folk who are going into the sciences, read widely, play games, learn some mathematics, and don't forget to take practical advice when it comes to planning your career. Thank you. Okay. So we've got plenty of time for questions. Anyone has any or comments? Yeah, you want to? Oh, there's a gentleman at the back there. So, are you saying you were part of the military before uh, becoming a researcher? No. Nope. What was your uh, doorway into? Um, so, did you have an interest in science early on, or was it the military? Uh, I had a great interest in science early on. I started a research project in high school that I finished at the end of my PhD, and then I was teaching at MIT. Then I joined the military. What was it about the military which um, made you think it'd be interesting in your research? So, I think you saw that I have done some stuff on the ecology of uh, antibiotics and uh, bacteria. And the military had an important problem, they still do, it's called wound infections. And I suggested that I had an interest in helping them solve their problem. And I saw a certain skepticism that I would stick to it. And I thought about it and talked to people and found that there was a path as a military researcher to work on the problem within the military in a more trusted capacity. Thank you. Does this, uh, does doing your research for the military make it a little bit more difficult to publish it? No. Yeah. No. Um, there are no practical restrictions on publication. Um, they give you an extra layer of review to make sure that you've abided by human subjects protection, animal protection. Um, but by and large, you should be doing that anyway, and if you're not, you're in trouble. Has your research sort of yielded any way of producing the bacteria that you talked about in any decent scale? Like, is there any way to produce them specific? Produce bacteria sentence? Yeah. So, that's an interesting thing. Um, my current conclusion with regard to bactericins is that their specificity in killing is such that we do not have appropriate diagnostics to suggest which bactericin you should be using in any given patient. And until you know what therapeutic you should use, the therapeutic is of limited value. So they very broad spectrum of the different strains. They're very, very narrow spectrum. Yeah, and their spectrum can be, um, it can appear a little bit random uh, from the sort of outsider's perspective because the core phylogeny of a genome uh, may look one way according to the housekeeping genes and so on, but then these receptors and things that make you susceptible to the bactericin um, may not have that same phylogeny. And so there may be a mismatch. And so you may look at a group of pathogens and say, oh, they're closely related, but the bacteria can only hit some of them, and it hits also some ones over here. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the receptors aren't restricted to strains necessarily. Yeah, you find this a lot in bacteria, that 
that different genes yield different inferred phylogeny. Does that make sense? Everybody know what a phylogeny is? Okay. So in your nature paper, didn't, you did some work, if I remember rightly, using plates as well, that you could show that you need mixed populations on the plate to maintain so the, there's the dynamic equilibrium. There's a second paper um, done by a friend of mine oh, right. where he took, oh, right. I miss, um, miss, miss he took fabric yeah. and he moved the bacteria around on plates and he watched the bacteria introgress in this sort of sweeping, swirling pattern of the killer always having a wave front in front of it into the sensitive populations and always being taken up at the back by the resistant populations. And the work was going on at the same time as the mouse work. And I find it very interesting because it shows how people will converge on the same sort of suggestions and solutions because we were talking to each other all the time. And, um, and it's just, he had the courage to do an elegant laboratory experiment. And I was completely nuts and did a sort of forehead to the wall animal experiment. So that at the end, there was no doubt that he had seen the phenomenon that he was looking for quite clearly. And there was no doubt that I had done it in a natural enough situation um, that it was relevant to nature. And together, the conclusion sort of solved this problem that had been sitting on everybody's lap for eight years. Um, without either one, it would have been a less compelling story. Are there other examples of, of the stone, scissors, paper kind of dynamics in, in, in large animals or plants? Yeah, or? so there's, um, there are a lot of systems, in fact, uh, where you find rock, scissors, paper dynamics. Um, there's uh, lizards that come in three morphs and they compete against each other. And, um, you know, each one has a fitness advantage. And I think what I didn't necessarily highlight in my talk well enough um, is that normally population geneticists like to think of fitness as a real value function. That is, fitness of one, fitness of two, or fitness actually of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way to one. Um, but once you introduce something like frequency-dependent selection, and particularly rock, paper, scissors, you actually can't use numbers at all, right? Because suddenly, 0 0.1 is less than and greater than 0 0.2, which is less than and greater than 0 0.3, right? It breaks the whole model. Um, and this is a really, really exciting thing because real numbers are so darn boring. You can line them up and they behave. But the moment you get into a nice, fun system like a tree, a phylogenetic tree, you can never represent the relationships on a phylogenetic tree by real valued numbers. You can't say organism one at the top of the tree is more closely related to organism two, more closely related to organism three, and then three is more closely related to four because you can start flipping the branches. Now, I don't know. But I just want to illustrate so that you sort of get the idea. So this tree is homomorphic with the tree where A, B, C, D, E, F, G, where you switch D and C. It's the same tree, right? And so if you do what people frequently try to do, which is say that there's some linear distance here, and then you can turn this into a real value distance, 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, or a distance of 1, and this, it's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. So, you know, then you need to go to more complicated sort of distance measures, um, like the, the sum of the branch lengths and so on. But it, it creates, there's, there's a fundamental complexity in this system such that you cannot represent this tree 
as a series of points on a line or a series of points in a plane. It just doesn't work. You need mathematics that's robust to non-real value numbers for this type of, of analysis. And for rock, paper, scissors, you know, you can try to imaginary numbers. There, there are a bunch of ways to deal with it. But you can't have real valued fitness. And if you don't have real valued fitness, just a whole lot of classical population genetics goes out the window. Which is why Harlan Clark, in a book this thick on population genetics, devotes about a paragraph to frequency dependent selection. Because it breaks the rest of the book. If you really wanted to write a book that included frequency dependent selection and just wasn't that special case of frequency independent selection, he would need a much fatter book. Oh, we see quite a lot of um, chronic wound infections where you can culture any number of bacteria from it, some of which may or may not, may or may not look pathogenic. Mm -hmm. And the impression that you have is that there's a stable equilibrium within that wound most of the time, and then at some, or there's an equilibrium, possibly, but then at some point it breaks down clinically and you get a clinical infection. Is, do you think that is around the of the equilibrium state or instruction of the organisms or host? So, so if we're talking chronic wounds that have persisted over the period of years, um, I'm not sure whether the the ecological succession has reached a stable state. But it's probably a pretty good guess. And the fact of the matter is that, um, that there's at least one group out there that has the hypothesis that the organisms at the base of that, the interface with the human, are actually putting out effector molecules into those cells to prevent cell sloughing and apoptosis to stabilize the niche that they're living in so that they can continue to leach off of you and have a good time. Um, at some point, though, that costs enough to the host that the host is probably in a bad way because the host hasn't certainly gone into equilibrium. He's continuing to go gray. And at some point, his body systems begin to break down. And some organism probably breaks out of, of the niche that they're in. And actually, in a way, I don't want to mix my metaphors too much, but you might think of that last organism as a sort of a cancer in the wound of the bacteria there. And it's sort of freely cheating and finishing off the host that the rest of the bacteria have spent so much time taking care of. Um, so that's sort of my perception with these chronic comorbid wounds that are persisting over a period of years. Am I sure that it's right? I'm not sure that it's right. I'd love to do experiments about it, except I've got other wounds to worry about. What do you think? Uh, I don't think we know. I think it's, um, I, think I hadn't really thought about it that way, actually. That actually, uh, the host is struggling not to maintain the equilibrium. And um, eventually you lose that match. It's a thought. Bacteriocins all the time. Um, Neeson is a bacteriocin uh, that's used to um, stabilize cheese fermentations and things. Um, there are a few other bacteriocins that have found industrial applications. Uh, as far as using bacteriocins in a clinical setting, I know of at least one guy who's got the clever idea to use bacteriocins in gum and chewing gum to eliminate the acid producing bacteria from the mouth. Um, I don't know how fast he's going to see resistance arise. I don't know quite a lot about um, the ultimate uh, end of that natural experiment. And I also don't know how uh, commercially viable it's going to be. But he's given it a go. And uh, they tend to be generally regarded as safe because they're frequently found in your own microflora. So it's easy to get these things approved by various governmental agencies. So I suspect you're going to see more people trying to do things with them in the future. 
When, when there's a lot of interest in the moment in, in um, using probiotics, mm -hmm. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just trying to get to grips with what that is all about. Is it that those probiotic organisms are producing bacteriocins that are excluding potential pathogens simply through that kind of chemical warfare, or is it more complicated that they're actually uh, occupying the same niche, the same receptors on cells or on surfaces? I mean, right. is there a feeling for wh which factors are most important yeah, in those kind so, of interactions? So, um, for one thing, there is, there's sort of two groups. Probiotics have been around as a concept for what I would characterize as a very, very, very long time. Just for general audience, that's the kind of friendly bacteria that people want you to yeah, eat so in this yogurt. Idea of, of putting bacteria into the animal, putting bacteria into genetic strains into animals, was an attempt at probiotics, and that went back to the 40s. Um, it was generally unsuccessful, as I mentioned, which led to sort of my whole issue. Uh, because they presumed, I mean, they had some of these early experiments, they looked like they were pilot experiments, where the guy thought, easy money. He's going to put this in there. It's going to wipe out the floor. He's going to, have, and then when it failed, he wasn't quite sure what to do. So he sort of put in a little paper and, and walked away from the whole mess. Um, so probiotics, if they are reliant only on bacteriocins to solve their problems, are almost certain to fail. I think that that's really one of the take-home messages from my research. Um, on the other hand, uh, probiotics can do a few other things. Um, one is this concept of uh, our star. Um, so uh, there's a guy by the name of Tillman. Uh, he was at Princeton, and he studied plants. And what he found is that you might have uh, a couple different um, resources that are being competed for by a plant. And if you put a plant into the setting, Maybe the resources start out here, and the organism draws down each resource until it hits a stable point here. And the stable point of the limiting resource, so depends on which your limiting resource is, the, that concentration is R star for that resource. And the reason that you use the, the R star, the reason it has one is because at some point that organism is not able to take up any lower of concentration of that. And so you might think about it in terms of all sorts of ideas. One is that you have a receptor and it has a binding kinetic and when, you're, when your concentration is too low, your receptor just doesn't function well anymore because the, the, PK, the, the PK, the physical chemistry of it all. Um, another is, you know, maybe you have a child running around picking up um, candy eggs all over the place. And when there are just too few candy eggs, the child has to run so much to get one that they just fall over from exhaustion before they get another bit of food. Um, or they run out of attention or something, probably more likely. Um, and so this is sort of the R star. And if you put it in an organism that has a lower R star, then it will draw down that limiting resource even further and eliminate the one outcompeted on the basis of its superior ability to deplete the environment. Ironic. Um, so he who depletes first and deepest wins. Um, now, a lot of probiotics work on this sort of principle, that you're simply going to de fill up your environment or deplete your resources to the point that whatever you're competing against isn't going to be able to come in. It's also a tricky problem. Um, I mean, typically, the most aggressive competitors are the ones we like to see least uh, in terms of pathogens, and say. They come in and say they, they find a way to free up iron in the gut by making you bleed, or you know, things like that. So probiotics are a tricky thing. Um, where I find probiotics to be interesting and I said that there are a few camps of probiotics. There are some people who identify the word probiotics with lactococci, and they say, uh, lactobacilli. And they say, oh, it's a lactobacillus. It's present in yogurt. It's good for you. Rub it all over. <laughs> please, 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 I beg you. Wrong answer. 
If another company comes to me and says, we're going to heal your wounds by smearing yogurt into them, I will find a sergeant who likes to talk a lot and set you off with that person all day just to waste your time. The real answer to probiotics in the small intestine might be lactobacilli, because that's where the lactobacilli like to live. But here's a solution that I pitched a while ago that's being funded, is this idea that some wounds heal. In fact, lots of wounds heal. In fact, in the Civil War, 80% of the wounds healed without any infections. Not a one of those wounds, I assure you, was free of bacteria. So what were all those bacteria doing? They clearly weren't causing any trouble, the wound healed. What if we could move those bacteria to a fresh wound and see if that wound heals? What if, what if it's merely priority effects? Priority effects are a wonderful explanatory term in a lot of ecology. They basically say, it doesn't matter if you're smart as long as you're lucky, right? He who gets there first wins, just by the fact of getting there first. It explains all sorts of things. It explains probably most business monopolies. If priority effects are a significant factor in whether a wound gets infected or not, based on whether a pathogen arrived before the healing compatible organism, then probiotics could be our solution. You just colonize everybody with a flora that's harmless, and we can roll on. However, it might not be that simple. We have to be open to that possibility as well. This might be because I completely don't know what I'm talking about, but the whole um, system of having a chronic wound, mm. would you be able to take bacteria cells from a wound like that and make them self-resistant and then have them stay alive and still affect the rest of the population? So take the bacteriocins from the chronic wound. Yeah, I don't know if they'd be any good if they could make them self-resistant, would they then be... So they would lose their own bacteriocins, or...? I'm, I'm no, if, you, if, you, if you were able to make bacteriocins that were self-resistant. Well, the bacteria that produce them are self-resistant. So, by yeah, the bacteria sort of that produce most bacteriocins... The ones that are actually engaged in the production generally commit suicide, but the ones that, um, that are close relatives have an immunity factor so that they don't die um, during the production. If you make a bacteria resistant to its own bacteriocin, uh, at least in some cases, the bacteria tends to lose the bacteriocin because the TA pair is destabilized, essentially and it's easier to lose the plasmid by segregation, but that's only under fast growth rates. Uh, I'm not sure I'm grasping what you're after. I was just when, uh, the start of what you were saying is that mostly when a animal is inoculated with a sensitive and mm. um, bacteria like harmful strain, mm -hmm. it tends to be they both get destroyed. But if you're able to create a situation where one stays alive whilst destroying the others, Mm. Just wondering if that be some uh, would that affect treatment for one? I'd have to I'd have to think about what you're after longer. I'm not sure you have I a get it phone on. call now, don't you? Is it six? Nearly. Yeah. So got we're a couple of minutes. Got a couple of minutes. Any further need. questions? Yes. Do you find the usual you were asked the usual game theorists and more into more traditional military applications? Well, you know, there are a lot of really, really, really smart people out there, and if I could count myself among them, that would be nice, but, um, you know, I'd rather respect what other people do, and that they do it well, than try to do it for them. Um, and so, you know, when I first got into wound infections, I had all sorts of interesting ideas and thoughts. And then I went and talked to a bunch of clinicians and a bunch of clinical microbiologists and a bunch of wounded soldiers. And I learned that everything that I was thinking about was pretty well useless. And so then the next part of the process was that 
I went and sat and thought a lot for a while longer and started to come up with some interesting stuff and talk to them some more and started winnowing through that. And that process took probably a good year. Um, and so I, I have to say I'm not charmed with the educational system here that suggests that a PhD is done in a relatively short amount of time. Because it actually takes a long time just to think first. Um, and I highly recommend it as a process, this sort of thinking thing. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well I think we should wrap up now. Thank you. Um, you've got a brief phone yeah. call and then you'll be around later, I suppose. But well, thank you for your attention yeah. and thank you for your time. And I appreciate you being here and I hope that uh, I've been of some use to you. Great.